Tom Vanderbilt is an American journalist, blogger, and author. He has written for publications like the Financial Times, Wired, Slate, New York Times Magazine, among others. Tom has written great books like Survival City, Adventures Among the Ruins of Atomic America, and Traffic. His latest book, Beginners, is about Tom's year of learning. Inspired by his young daughter's insatiable need to know how to do almost everything, Tom set out on this journey purely for the sake of learning. He aimed to learn five skills, choosing them for their difficulty to master and their lack of marketability. Chess, singing, surfing, drawing, and juggling. We spoke to Tom about the mindset required to become a good learner. What we can learn from how children learn, the role of curiosity, feedback, and mentoring in learning. Tom also gave some actionable tips for leaders who want to build a continuous learning organization. So go on and listen to this insightful discussion as we pick Tom's brains about how to become a learning machine. This is the CTQ Smartcast, where we have conversations about up-leveling, deliberate practice and getting future relevant. Yeah. Hi, welcome Tom. Welcome to the CDQ Smartcast. Thank you, Harish. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks. So let me put you in the deep end, you know, right off the bat, right? So what do you know about learning that not many other people uh, know? <laughs> um, well, hopefully something, but uh, let's see. I mean, one thing that you know, kind of struck me working on this book very and, and doing and trying to learn the things I was trying to learn early on a, a very common concept that everyone sort of knows or thinks they knows, which is uh, the learning curve. And, you know, we always hear this expression, oh, you know, there was such a steep learning curve. And I think we take this to mean that something was very difficult to learn. But, you know, at the risk of being, you know, sort of academic and pedantic here, um, you know, learning curve, the actual phrase, which comes from the world of psychology, refers, um, you know, if you had sort of an X, Y axis, you know, time on one side, progress on the other. So a steep learning curve means that you're actually making a lot of progress in your learning very early on at, at a, you know, sometimes a very uh, sharp upward rate. So, uh, you know, in fact, this is something that should be celebrated, not, not feared, the idea of, of a steep learning curve. And it was something that I was trying to learn a number of, of skills in my life. And I found that in all of these things, the progress was really quite remarkable in the very beginning stage. It's not that it didn't become much harder as I went on, but this you know, almost created sort of an intoxicating feeling to me in which I was, I was really sort of emboldened. And I think this is one of the great things about being a beginner. It's a word that a lot of us as adults associate in a, in a sort of fearful way, but you know, the, the humans as essentially learning machines throughout their lives, you know, we have this amazing capacity to adapt and to learn something. You know, we you know we could get up and running pretty quickly in a given skill. Not that it's going to come equally fast for every person, or that some skills won't be harder than others. But um, so that that's 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 just one concept that was. Um, Sort of I, I ended up thinking differently about and I, I almost use sort of a motivational tool when I'm you know thinking about something right yeah yeah so I think that is an underrated aspect of learning that um, we at least we as adults sometimes either just you know don't don't give enough attention to uh, uh, at, at times uh, I guess so coming back to this you know thing about great learners children are great learners we all know that you know it's, it's almost uh, uh, assume that yeah if you are a child you are a great uh, learner i wanted to bring uh, back what you just said uh, you know for the earlier question as well right so uh, children are great learners because they are also trying to learn a lot of new things they are novices at almost everything right mm. uh, which is why uh, the the learning curve is much steeper for them they are also getting you know, excited about learning new things. We're actually happy about learning uh, uh, new things, right? They need to probably learn to just survive, you know, from walking to expressing, you know, the, 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 the need to be fed and, and all these things. They have an innate desire to learn. What changes 
when we become adults. Good question. Yeah, and I mean, as you mentioned, you know, survival is not to be underestimated as a as a a learning motivation. I mean, this is the thing. You know, children are strongly motivated to learn, not not even out of any sense of motivation, but like you say, just to function in the world. And this is something. You know, by the time we reach our adult years, we've pretty much taken care of all those fundamental tasks. So nothing is going to seem as urgent as walking, talking. So you know, it's going to be hard for the adult to, to you know, summon that kind of intensity. I mean, if you were sort of dropped in a foreign country, you know, it sounds like a spy movie or something and just dumped on the street and given a hundred dollars and you have to survive, you know, you'll probably learn that language, you know, much more quickly than if you were sitting in the comfort of your home you know, doing Duolingo um, at your leisure. So, you know, that, that but so the, the motivation uh, aspect is very strong there. But a lot of other things change. Um, one thing that changes is the learning environment. Children, you know, just have the most supportive learning environment possible in general. Uh, you know, learning institutions, teachers, mentors, parents who, uh, you know, basically applaud anything the child does, any, the, the merest hint of progress is taken by most parents, including myself, as a major uh, achievement. Even failure is perceived, you know, in, in a less than critical manner because, you know, oh, they're, it's just a child, they'll get better, of course they're going to make mistakes. Um, and on the question of failure, this is an interesting point, I think, that I, for example, in the, in the book, uh, spent some time at New York University, there's something there called the Infant Action Lab. And what they do is study the process of infants learning to move and to, to walk, to crawl. And they basically record infants for hours on end. And they found that the number of, of falls that happen to a, a learning to walk infant in an hour is astronomical. Uh, it could be upwards of 70 times per hour. Uh, so, you know, and, and luckily they're built to sort of handle this in, in a way they're you know sort of soft and, and cushioned and their bodies are, are not rigid. But it, it, the average adult, if you went to some sort of, I'm not, I'm not sure, like a, a tennis lesson and you were trying to serve a tennis ball and you failed 70 times in the first hour, it would be very hard for that, that adult learner to continue on. Um, I mean, what else changes in the adult? I mean, we should point out that definitely the cognitive uh, firepower, the cognitive architecture changes. I mean, children, it's been called the less is more hypothesis because, because children actually have so little that's currently occupying their brain, the absorption of, of new material, new information, of new skills is that much easier. Whereas adults, well, when I began this book, I was uh, in my mid, mid 40s and, um, you know, I had already learned a lot of things, a lot of information. So, just to take language again, if I went to, to try to learn a new, a new language, say, uh, you know, I don't know, Croatian, Serbo Croatian, uh, you know, number one, I would, I would have the grammatical structure of English firmly in, entrenched in my mind, and, and that would be an obstacle that would get in the way. So it, it's, it's true with, with many other things. When I, uh, you know, learning to sing, I had to overcome a lot of my habits uh, from speech uh, because those are two sort of contradictory acts and they can kind of get in the way of one another. So, so children have this immense uh, openness and, and you know, a kind of unformed aspect that allows them to just bring this in. Um, another thing I would say is they don't really have a conscious notion of being a beginner. I mean, they, they, the concept novice beginner doesn't mean anything to them. They're just trying to take something on. Whereas adults, the word beginner, as I sort of mentioned before, is very loaded. It's very it's not a state that we want to be in. It's a word that we don't look upon kindly. Um, and it, it's just, it, it's not something that we're accustomed to very often. Um, so we, we want to sort of move through that or avoid that stage. But the problem with avoiding that stage is that can actually short circuit uh, the learning process. So in some ways, you know, you have to embrace this beginnerness. So that's yeah, so that kind of, I think, sums up some of the things that, um, oh, yeah, just one last point is that children really have nothing but time. I mean, their whole, they have no job. Their job is to simply learn. Adults were very busy. You know, I, I started playing chess uh, for the book. I would love to become a chess grandmaster, but I am not Magnus Carlsen or, or Vichy Anand. You know, I don't have 
12, 13 hours a day to sit in my room as a kid and, you know, read through chess books and do chess puzzles and play games. I, I just don't have that time. So uh, that, that's another thing that happens. We, we, we lose that an immense amount of time. So people often focus too much on how children's brains are sort of more nimble and faster than adults, but th there's all sorts of contextual factors that matter as well, that if adults had some of the same time, uh, positive environment as children, they would probably make quite a, quite a bit of, of gain. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think that, that's a very important point, uh, Tom. In fact, I was just, you know, thinking about this when you said, uh, you know, when you made the comparison between walking and tennis, right? So if, if you were to go and play uh, tennis and start, you know, trying to serve and you actually fail 70 times in an hour, even though the coach is actually giving you very good feedback, you know, you as the player would not want to be in that position, right? Because you somehow assume that you have just because you're bigger in size and you know, you know some things outside the court well, uh, you should be uh, able to learn how to serve much, much faster than uh, what a so-called novice or, or a beginner uh, should take. And I think is that, that mindset that you need to have, uh, which as you say, the the child just doesn't even know that there is this concept of a mindset, of a beginner's mindset, right? So do you think that is, I mean, way more important than the learning environment or the, the just the cognitive ability um, uh, as you contrast a child and a man? And a, and a I, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think mindset is huge. I mean, number one, because, you know, often when I was failing in certain tasks, it, it was my brain, you know, sort of getting in the way. It wasn't my actual physical ability. And, and often part of that was a lack of confidence or a pressure I was putting upon myself because I thought, you know, oh my God, I'm 50 years old. I should be able to do this or, you know, <laughs> but, you know, so the, the great thing about, I think taking on that beginner mindset is that it frees you from that pressure and, and pressure is very counterproductive to learning. I heard this time and again from coaches I was dealing with that, adults just simply put too much pressure upon themselves. They, they treat, the, treat the exercise with nothing but, nothing but pain and struggle as something to, to get through as quickly as possible. Whereas if we could sort of bring some joy to it and, and use that concept of beginnerdom to allow ourselves time and freedom for exploration and to grant ourselves the ability and, and permission to make mistakes, knowing that without mistakes, there is no learning. So I mean, look, mistakes are a key, key part of uh, learning. And I, I should say, when you were talking about the tennis and, and feedback, I mean, the only problem is if, if you fail 70 times an hour and you never succeed once, <laughs> the only problem with that is that feedback actually seems to work better when it's positive feedback. So when, when you're told why you did something correctly rather than sort of pointing out why you did something wrong. So <laughs> hopefully you will you know, get something almost a bit right so the instructor can give you a, a bit of positive feedback, but that's just, uh, but yeah, so I think my mindset is, is huge and you need to go into these learning exercises with a sense of, of humility. And it's, you know, the concept is called intellectual humility in, in psychology. And it, it, it means admitting to yourself and to others that you have something to learn, which is, it sounds sort of ridiculous, but this is often a stumbling block. We, we don't think we have, the, you know, we don't think we need to learn something or that we can't teach ourselves or that, uh, you know, we, we should have already learned that. Um, so all those kind of fall on, under the concept of mindset, I think. Right, right. And, and you know, again, uh, extending the idea of intellectual humility to curiosity. Right. And I mean, if, if I look at your example, uh, I mean, I, I see you being curious about topics as wide ranging as football to Cold War to traffic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is the role of curiosity in becoming this, you know, this the holy grail of becoming a, a learning machine? Yeah, I mean, curiosity is huge. And, you know, there, there's a, a sense here also curiosity, intellectual humility, but you also need to, uh, how, how to describe this, you know, if, you know, sometimes an editor for an, a magazine or, or you will call me up and say, you know, we'd like to write this piece about topic X. And they'll say, you know, how much do you know about that? And I have to admit that if I if I always told the truth and said, oh, you know, I, I really, I've never heard of that. I know nothing about that. 
I would not get any work. So, you know, part of part of being a journalist is is having that, you know, the sort of gumption, the the sense that you're going to, you know, take the risk and that you you will be able to learn enough about that subject in a short time to and, and again, I'm not supposed to be the expert in writing the story. I am simply supposed to talk to the experts and tell their story and synthesize the information. So I, it kind of is the same with this uh, book that I wrote. If if I thought all these things I took on, singing, drawing, surfing, there was nothing in my previous life that would indicate that I would be good at any of those things. I was never encouraged, oh, you know, you should, I bet you have a wonderful singing voice. You should, you should do that. So if I listen... If I listen to my own negative uh, self-talk in that regard, the book the book would not have happened. So I think you know there's this key thing where curiosity often involves you know opening a door and stepping beyond this threshold into this into this new region. But you know again you you have to give yourself that beginner uh, flexibility that you know it might take you a while to really understand the field to understand you know what's important about it what what the resources are. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I think the, the act of skill learning itself tends to breed, at least it did for me, even more curiosity. I mean, this was something that surfing, for example, became not just a, a motor skill, not just a, a fun way to spend a, an afternoon at the beach, but, you know, what, because I was exposed to this new part of my world, this uh, ocean that lay right at the foot of one of the world's largest cities, New York City, um, you know, I suddenly started seeing the world in a new way and asking questions I hadn't really asked about topics like oceanography or uh, the migratory patterns of seabirds and, you know, th things that you know, I might not have had occasion uh, to ask. So the, the, the sort of the act of putting your body in the world in a new way actually helped open my mind uh, in new ways also. Right, right. And, and uh, I think one thing that I've noticed with uh, at least some people, which I've heard, is they do get these questions, like you said, you know, things around oceanography or migratory patterns of, uh, you know, birds, but then they leave it there. Uh, they don't take that next step of actually, you know, finding out more about that topic, uh, you know, answering the question that they had. And then the next stage of actually manifestation of that curiosity as well. It could be writing a note, uh, you know, an article, a blog post, um, or just uh, sending an email to their teammates, things like that. So what do you do as a manifestation of your curiosity, which is where it's not about, you know, writing that article or writing that book, but you have these questions in your mind. How do you deal with those questions? What what happens next? I mean, I, I guess for me, it's, it's mostly a... A research process, uh, uh, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, the internet or before the internet, I used to spend a lot of time in places like the New York Public Library, the main uh, branch, or finding someone who actually knows something about that topic and just, you know, in some sense, beginning a conversation. And it's not, it always doesn't directly lead to work for my, you know, uh, some article. Sometimes it's just a, a, an itch I need to scratch. And, um, but I think, yeah, I mean, there's, I have all sorts of lists where I've written things down of things I would like to look into. And, and certainly I haven't done all of that. So often, um, you know, I guess it's, it, it's sort of a self-selecting process. The things that strike you at the moment or seem most interesting or loom most importantly, those are the things you focus on. But I think, again, it's just a matter of, of opening that door and knowing that there are, you know, in this day and age to, to not follow your curiosity when there are so many resources available uh, you know, the world over. I mean, you have access to every library in the world, you know, digitally, access to almost every printed book in, in history. <laughs> so, you know, it's just friction free, really. Um, so it's, it's a matter of just, I guess, listening to your own own voice and, and maybe not having, maybe not giving yourself an expectation that, oh, I'm not going to do that because it, it might not be important to me. Or, you know, just, 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 you know, we don't necessarily watch a movie or a television show because we know how it's going to end or we know it's it's going to be good. We sometimes just, you know, a process of exploration. And I think a learning should be, or a curiosity should function the same way. Right, right. And, and any uh, secret hacks that you use in terms of, you know, keeping notes and how do you do your, you know, uh, information management, knowledge management? Yeah, no, I know that there are people that, 
fetishize this and uh but my process is very I, I should say poor and perhaps a bit old school i i have a sort of a large moleskin notebook that i just write lists just just lists it's not it's not a nice bullet journal or anything it's just a very simple thing and i've, I've tried to use uh what do i have i have something called bear uh, it's an app on my computer, which is sort of a note-taking um, thing, which I do use to some regard, but um, a lot of my information finding is just a Microsoft Word data dump that I then do a lot of control F searching for that fragment of what I had. had that. So it's, it's it, I'm sure it could be better, and I, I would love to hear any any tips from you or, or others about, about how to get better at that. Right. Yeah, yeah. We've been experimenting a lot with uh, some of the space repetition apps uh, like Anki and Readwise, which sort of keep surfacing some of these uh, ideas from time to time that that has uh, helped. And um, yeah, some of these read later apps like Pocket, uh, again, is, is something which we found very uh, useful. Uh, but yeah, the, the yeah. traditional note taking, I think, is, is the best way. We've been trying to do some of that, you know, the Cornell method of note taking and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where you, uh, you know, write write the uh, headings on one side of the of the page and, and all of that. Um, we try to keep yeah. experimenting with these things. Uh, some of them are stick. Some of them uh, are like fads. Uh, so the bullet journal has never worked for me or my co-founder Ramanan. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny what you say about um, what you say about manifesting. It, it you know it strikes me that you know for me the mere act of of holding pen to paper right. you know actually seems like a form of manifestation. I mean, the, and I know there's been research about this, but you know just the, just that act of writing something down. Um, there's a great uh, there's a great um, adver almost an advertising slogan by a company called I think Field Notes, and they said. Um, I'm not writing it down, so I'll remember it later. I'm writing it down, so I remember it now. I mean, there's something about the way we encode memory more strongly through that act of, of actually writing and doing that little bit of physical labor. And it, to me, it reminds me of the same thing of, I'm, I'm admittedly a, a print devotee of, of you know print media and books. And I feel, I have read eBooks, but I, I feel like there's just a more tangible relationship with the, the word on the printed page that to my mind, I have better memory retention of that material. It seems less ephemeral. And um, again, there's been some research on this, uh, but anyway, that's just my own personal uh, proclivity. <laughs> All right, yeah. So before before we uh, uh, you know go forward to the next uh, question, I actually had a trivia quiz question for you. Uh, you know, based on all the stuff that I've read about you and we love our quizzing. So we thought I'll, mm -hmm. I'll not let you go without at least one quiz question, right? So here's, here's the quiz uh, question. So again, very, you might be knowing this, but definitely this is related to your work. Okay. Uh, so what did John F. Kennedy ask his head of press to do just before he signed the order placing an embargo on trade with Cuba? He asked him for something very specific and, and uh, got I'm it done for him. Guessing something like many boxes of Cuban cigars or bottle, bottles Perfect. of rum, perhaps. <laughs> Perfect answer there. <laughs> he actually asked him to get 1,000 cigars and he, he actually got him 1,200. <laughs> so as soon as he got him, he then went and, you know, signed the... <laughs> That's a great, I've, I've not heard that story before. It's a great story, but I just, yeah, using uh, uh, intuition, right? <laughs> <laughs> very well worked out, very well worked out in that case. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, again, I was just fascinated by the breadth of topics that you have uh, uh, covered. And uh, I thought since you've you know, done so much work on Cold War as well, let me you know, throw this quiz question at you. So yeah, let's let's move to the next uh, question. Not a trivia quiz question, but uh, do you think there are some types of skills that are more amenable for adults to pick up and think of corporate professionals? Are there skills that are more amenable for learning because of you know they say there is a, some skills have this wicked learning environment, whereas in some yeah. you have this you know feedback which is quite obvious. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I would, I'm, I'm trying, you know, it's a great question. I'm trying to think of um, 
some, some examples here. I mean, because, you know, the one thing, the one advantage adults do have, of course, is an entire history of learning things. So we have this, all these sort of meta structures, you know, how to learn. We are in theory stronger at than a child who every new thing they're sort of taking on as they see it, they don't necessarily have a, a methodology or um, so the more complex something becomes, I, I could see where an adult would have that advantage. And if you, if you look at the game of, of chess, for example, um, you know, children uh, such as my daughter are often better in the beginning stages at, at just pure calculating sort of power and, 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 and let's say pattern recognition. They have these, you know, this, this nimble, nimble brain, but what they don't necessarily have is the sort of patience and uh, for, the, for the long game and, and, the, and these concepts of strategy and deeper questions such as human psychology of you know, how your opponent is acting and you know that sort of uh, the stuff that comes into place in a game like poker, but which also has its place in chess, at least psychologically. Um, so a, a player might hit a certain period of, of maturation where, you know, there's certainly very good, very young players. In fact, there's a 12 year old grandmaster uh, in the state of New Jersey now, but you see the world champions, you know, in like in professional sports in their twenties, going into their thirties, uh, you know, this period of maturation. So I, I would think, you know, when it comes to just raw skill acquisition, you know, ch you know, younger children do have that advantage, but adults, um, you know, when, it, when it's a more complex, wider ranging set of things that need to come into play, I, I think adults, you know, can, can have, have a strength there. And, and what do you think is the role of uh, feedback and mentoring in learning? And, and here again, I'm talking more from the perspective of adults, right? Uh, and does it change depending on what you are trying to learn, the level of expertise you are aiming for? So are you just trying to understand the basics of a chess or a tennis or do you want to, you know, really yeah. reach the ATP tour level? Uh, how yeah, I mean, yeah, feedback is... is is very important, obviously, and it's it's very important as you suggest. You know when it's delivered, how it's delivered, you know by whom it's delivered, and you know what is actually delivered. And I think you know one thing I encountered in my learning process in various skills was that it was often desirable to be around other beginners or or other you know people of of mixed talent, but not outright super proficient, like, like the instructor. I mean, most instructors, if you're going to teach something, you know, most people at that are, are proficient at that level. And the problem is, is that, you know, often they are so far from where you are in your learning journey that it becomes hard for them to connect the dots and put themselves back in, in your shoes. And in, in some ways, the novice and the master are kind of identical at different ends of the spectrum. I mean, the novice knows nothing about the skill but the master sort of knows everything, but he's forgotten what it's like to know nothing. So you know they're they're both operating in these in these states of of ignorance in a sense. So I found that you know even even with good teachers, it was still great to have other students around because I would often sometimes directly learn from them. They would sort of give me advice. I, I was in a drawing class and would, would walk by and you know say, oh, you know your shading might be you know, improved if you use this pencil, something like that. Um, but I could also see a range of skill that was closer to my own. And it, it gave me a sense of how I might get to that next level. Whereas if I, if I take a drawing class with, let's say the modern day uh, Da Vinci, whoever that may be, it, it's going to be hard for me to exactly figure out what he's doing because he has gone through so many stages. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously I, I received a lot of feedback over the course of learning. It was often, um, you know, and there's two things that feedback can do. It can, you know, sort of correct your technique, which is important, but it can also provide motivation. Right. And, you know, so I think feedback can be used, you know, excessively negative feedback. It just becomes self-defeating, I think. And you start to wonder, you know, why should I even go on? So I, I think feedback, as much as it has that correcting uh, possibility, needs to be, needs to come with this idea that you know we're, we're trying to push the person along not push them back about was what is the role of mentoring for uh, you know adults uh, while learning and am, am i correct in um, you know saying that when you're talking about feedback so mentor doesn't necessarily have to be this 
you know, expert who is a mentor, but even a peer, just somebody who's slightly ahead of you on the curve is also to be seen as a mentor? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's this, this concept, the, the community of learning, where something like a choir, I, I you know, belong to a choir, it was a range of, of people, a range of skills. And I, you know, I sort of, I, w- I was learning by doing, you know, I, I, I was taking vocal lessons on the side, which was sort of the, the raw pedagogical material. But then I was trying to put that into practice and not put it into practice in my own sort of sterile environment at home to myself. But, you know, I was doing it where it counted. Like we, you know, we had to produce a material to, to perform in front of a live audience. So there was not only a very strong motivational component, but I, I could sense that there, there was a reason for what I was learning and that, and that sort of made it more tangible and made, made you know, it sort of clicked a little bit more. And um, I guess what I was going to say about feedback before, another, another issue that comes up a lot nowadays uh, with, with the absolute proliferation of online learning, you know, there are all these things I did in the book, possible exception of, of surfing is a little bit hard. Uh, you know, I could have really learned almost exclusively online or, or at least picked up quite a bit of material. And so I, I have nothing but praise for YouTube and, and Coursera and, and Khan Academy and Duolingo and, and all these places. But there comes a point where for certain activities, sort of the, some of these more you know wicked environment skills that that you mentioned, that just learning by yourself in the absence of feedback, you know, playing guitar, you can you can mimic someone's guitar playing on YouTube and become a pretty effective guitar player, a pretty effective mimic. I mean, there may be some higher skills at which you're going to have to sort of interface with an actual coach or or mentor to understand some of the nuance. I mean, and then there are other skills like, let's say a tennis serve where you really need to have someone at some point watching you serve because you can't watch yourself and you need that feedback to be actionable and from an external source. So you can watch someone serve a tennis ball a thousand times on YouTube. And I doubt that you'll actually learn how to serve a tennis ball. I mean, you, you, you could, I mean, there's, there's definitely something where watching something helps us to enact the actual motor skill but you know to really you know sort of pick it up this is where feedback becomes important and and it's with certain skills that it's that much more important um in certain you know like the game of chess computerized engines have, have really you know stepped in to allow a lot of this sort of auto feedback through you know sort of essentially ai so there are a lot of great resources in that regard but there were still a lot of for me you know real in person teaches, coaches, mentors that, um, and just, just one last point, you know, even as I was still a fledgling uh, beginner, novice in some of these skills, I myself was already beginning to teach other people who knew even less than I did. And that, of course, is just a completely powerful way to, you know, this sort of virtuous cycle of that. I don't even really, I don't, not sure I even fully understand the mechanism at work, but just sort of cementing and, and growing your own knowledge by having to explain it to someone else. And, and then they may ask questions of what you're asked of telling them. And that may make you think about the thing in a new light as well. So I, I think in medical school, they have an expression, see one, do one, teach one. And that sort of refers to this thing. So I just a couple of months ago, for example, my daughter was asked to do a drawing for a school, uh, you know, sort of a co- art competition sort of thing. And so she drew this picture of our cat um, from a photograph. And then I, she showed it to me and she was feeling upset about it, that it wasn't as good as she wanted. So I, without wanting to actually do the drawing myself, I tried to, you know, teach her some things. And it, it felt very satisfying because I, I was able to, to do something with this knowledge that I had acquired myself it gave me a certain sense of competence and, and confidence. And, um, and I could, I could sort of feel something clicking as, as I did it, like, Oh, you know, this, this is how this works. And it was, it was through that teaching process. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's fascinating. I think it's, it's uh, very important to think about what all is required to be proficient in the skill that you are trying to, uh, you know, learn. Uh, for example, we, we have, People who have, you know, Olympians who have learned uh, throwing a javelin uh, just by watching YouTube videos. 
but uh, if you look at it the the environment is not very wicked right it's it's not the same as what you will need to you know master while say you know serving in tennis uh, which is going to be very different because you have to you know master different ways of serving based on the surface based on your opponent strategy uh, yeah. you know, position in the game uh, but it's not that wicked it's not going to change that much for a javelin throw you, you're always going to just go max out right <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is the, you know, for with surfing, for example, I, I always go back to surfing because this is a very difficult sport that, you, you know, until you're actually on that board in the ocean, on those waves, and I, I should point out that no two waves are the same. Waves are always changing. Oceans are always changing. So there, there's no sense watching a video of someone surf of what is actually in, involved in that. So you really need to put your your body through the process. And Oftentimes, even my coach was unsure of what feedback to give me because the environment is so complex that he wasn't sure how I could have actually done something any better than I did. So it was just sort of like throw your hands up moment. Um, you know, luckily not everything is like that, and there's usually a more, much more clear uh, path. But and this, you know, making mistakes is important for learning. It, it's sort of an essential process. But I think. One of the great things about being amongst other students is that seeing people make mistakes is a very instructive way to learn. And you know, you sort of, you know, you can sort of work out in your own brain how they could have avoided what happened to them, or you know, just or just in terms of motivation, like, oh, I didn't do that, so now I feel better. But um, this just, you know, if you're always working with an expert level performer they don't they don't tend to make mistakes or they've figured out how to correct their mistakes instantly so you never see this this process that's so important right right coming back to your book um, when you started your learning journey did you have any uh, tripwires in mind uh, that if i'm not able to cross this level i'll probably you know not write about this or you know pick up another skill give give myself some more time uh, or you knew that whatever be the proficiency level you achieve, just documenting the journey is a good book idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> book project front. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I tried not to have goals ahead of time that were too rigid because, I mean, number one, I didn't really know what would even be required. I, I'm not even sure I knew what goals to set because I didn't really know enough about the the skill itself and what was what was reasonable, what was practical, what what was achievable. And I think that that's constructive in the end because, you know, while achieving goals is is greatly rewarding, not achieving goals is perhaps two x as demoralizing. So I, I I kept my goals very small, and really tried to make learning itself the goal. If if I, whatever progress I could walk away with, you know, I would. It would still be a process of growth, which I thought was important. And, and also, one thing to think about, you know, with learning as an adult uh, skill or even knowledge, that you know, once you go down that path, often you you're already kind of just learning a little bit begins to separate you from, you know, ninety eight percent of the population. I mean, it, to, so to take something like juggling, I started with one ball and then I did two balls and I did three balls and I did four balls. I got sort of stuck on, and you, and you talk about uh, trip wires. I was stuck and still cannot do five, which is actually a very difficult skill. It takes a year of dedicated, deliberate practice. Um, so it's, I, it, I'm trying not to view it as a great failing. And I take comfort in the fact that people like, you know, famous mathematicians, like, you know, or scientists like Richard Feynman, who were interested in juggling, also did not do five balls. So there are people that can juggle 11 balls. But um, so, yeah, so I, I think, and I also chose skills that I knew, I had a sense that I was genuinely interested in and that I would, I would enjoy even, even sort of failing at, or even being sort of mediocre at, I would still enjoy, I would still find something to take away from that. So I, there were some things I thought about in the beginning. Um, I, I decided, I wondered, oh, you know, I'm, I was always a terrible math student, for example. So I thought, well, it would be really, really good to know statistics for my job. But I was, I, in the back of my head, I, I was worried that I had all those like 
uh, teenage feelings coming out again that maybe I'm going to be really bad at math again and this is going to be nothing but frustration and it will not I'll get stuck I'll I'll implode so I I, I walked away from it for that reason and also because I wanted to make it you know purely sort of a pleasure project and not and and, and not things that weren't actually directly uh, affect me in my job. Not that there's obviously anything wrong with improving one's skills for one's career, but that would be a separate uh, project for me. Right, right. And, and in the process of writing the book, did you also do a lot of research on things like deliberate practice, Erickson's work around that, you know, the, the idea of flow, or you mentioned Feynman, you know, the whole Feynman method of learning where you know, you actually learn something by trying to explain it to someone, things like space repetition. Were these things that you already knew or did you do deliberate research, <laughs> like deliberate <laughs> practice, you know, before embarking on this project? Yeah, I mean, some of them I, I was vaguely aware of, but I definitely did do further research, if only to hopefully give myself a leg up. And I mean, it's sort of, you know, and, and in some cases I... I did profit from these things. In some cases, you know, it's a bit like, you know, you know what food you're supposed to eat that provides the most nutrition. Uh, you know, I, I should always eat this every day, but there were days I was lazy and I just wanted, you know, pizza. So uh, the point being that I, I know, for example, that the benefits of spaced repetition and I, I in doing a game like chess and trying to get better at chess, I use uh, things like Chessable, which is an app built around this very idea. It, you, it gives you lessons and sort of revisits what you've already learned at certain discrete moments in time to when it's most uh, productive for, for the learner. So I, I tried to do those things, but also I found myself, you know, it's sort of easier in some ways and more fun to simply play many games of chess, especially something like blitz chess, which you can squeeze in uh, during your lunch hour at work. However, as fun as that is, you know, that is not necessarily deliberate practice, which would involve, you know, playing, uh, playing a game, then analyzing it afterwards, really understanding what the mistakes were, then trying to, you know, move those forward into your next game. Um, you know, I, I often don't analyze the games. Uh, you know, so it, some of this stuff takes just a certain extra level of, of dedication. But um, so to, and anyway, to answer your question, yeah, I did. You know, I did want to at least have some knowledge of those, uh, you know, of what we've learned about learning, of, of learning how to learn, which is a great uh, book by Barbara Oakley. You know, the, I, I didn't want to try to write that book because it's, I sense it was already, has already been written by, by various uh, people. But, you know, I, uh, I, I certainly found, my, found no disagreement with any of those um, strategies and uh, it's just a matter of sometimes having the discipline to uh, apply them. Uh. <laughs> and, and do you think uh, there is a newfound interest in learning about the, the, the meta journeys of learning? Uh, for people, we have books like, uh, you know, Moonwalking with Einstein by Joshua Farr or, uh, you know, Maria, Mariah Konnikova's book about poker, The Biggest Bluff. They're all about these, you know, or, or even if we take your book, right? It's all about your journey. You are the hero in this uh, book. And I want to, you know, probably derive some vicarious pleasure out of, you know, reading about your journey. So is there some something that is happening in, in the last few years that people really want to read uh, more about these kind of journeys? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, I mean, number one, I should say that both of those books you mentioned, which are, are both excellent, uh, you know, those people, those authors became incredibly proficient in the right. things they were trying to conquer, which of course I'm very envious of and, and in, in awe of. I mean, I wish I was a better chess player today than I was when I started. I'm, you know, I'm okay, but I'm not ready like Maria Konnikova to go to Atlantic City and start um, <laughs> trying to beat top chess players. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I think, you know, and I think both of those books, because those authors also draw upon some of these things we've learned that, you know, I guess what, what we talk about something like the Flynn curve, this idea that IQ has, has risen over the last few uh, decades. I and mean, I think there's been sort of a, a Flynn effect with, with learning as well, because there are so many 
resources available, and we've learned so much about the most effective way to learn that, uh, you know, I think people are progressing in certain fields faster now and making, you know, and, and hitting new highs. I mean, you know, chess grandmasters or professional Fortnite players, the video game. I mean, you, you, you know, there's just so many ways to, so many ways to, to be around the best people and to learn faster from them that, um, you know, everything's sort of sped up, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, I guess, that, you know, in terms of um, journeys, I mean, in those books, like I said, they have this wonderful arc in which the person does become very good. Um, and they, of course they, and they focused on one thing and they put all their energy into that one thing. Maybe if my book had been just a single focus on chess or singing, I would be better at any of those things. But it, I was trying to send a message to you know other people that as fun as it is to read about those sorts of books, you know, not everyone is going to be able to pull that off. And you may not have the skill, you may not have the time, uh, this so-called you know, 10,000 hours rule 10,000 hours of practice required to become an expert level performer, you know, I was probably lucky to have 100 hours of with, with these skills. So what, you know, was that still worth it? Were there things I could learn? Would it impact my life in a positive way? I think the answer to all those questions is yes, but I have to kind of just give up the idea that it's going to be here and then I'm going to be dwelling, you know, sort of here and then that can still be an interesting place because before I wasn't even, I was down here, I wasn't even visible. So, you know, that, that, that was sort of the message I was trying to send that, and that you should not necessarily think that it's only going to be one thing, poker, Scrabble, chess, whatever, that you should feel free to dabble, to experiment, and maybe something will click among all those things. And it's also okay to walk away from something if it's not providing you with, with the right amount of pleasure. So, yeah, yeah. So life will come in the way. So, you know, don't get on to these, <laughs> you know, these kind of life-changing pro projects unless you're being asked to write a book about it, right? <laughs> no, I mean, but many people find the time and they do. And of course, one thing that's interesting about the pandemic, you know, that I think a, a lot of your you know, viewers, you know, people suddenly were forced to think about things in a new way. They might have had new ways to spend time because the former ways they spent time were no longer available to them. So all of us might have this mental list in our head of, I would really like to dot, dot, dot. Uh, you know, the only thing stopping you was time and your own habits, but suddenly there was an interruption of your habits and you might've had more time. So the door opens and we've seen people, you know, the statistics here are quite clear, you know, at, from the sales of guitars to guitar lesson uh, websites, you know, just anything with a learning bent, was sort of a self-improvement bent has gone up during the the pandemic so it's um okay. one 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 maybe the only t positive takeaway from uh the last <laughs> last few years i think <laughs> right right and, and anything can be a trigger right queen's gambit uh leads to <laughs> you know craze about chess <laughs> yeah yeah i mean many people that that you know, that door was open watching Queen's Gambit. And then I, I use Queen's Gambit also though, as an example of people would, I would talk to people who watched the Queen's Gambit and I said, oh, you should, you should try to do chess. And they said, well, I just don't have the time. And I, I would say, you just spent 10 hours of your life watching <laughs> Queen's Gambit. You could actually learn quite a bit about chess in 10 hours. You're not going to become a grandmaster, but, you know, so, you know, I think people often, time is, is really just an excuse for, other issues that that sort of you know failure of of confidence or imagination but um but anyway yeah but but many people did take that journey and chess websites like the other websites i mentioned are are doing record record business these days yeah. <laughs> not that i not that i predicted that when i started to <laughs> play chess no it was also your book that <laughs> led to this <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, you've also written about making learning a social activity. So in this context, what is your take on this whole, you know, cohort based uh, courses that's become sort of the craze right now? Um, well, and just so I understand that phrase, you're essentially talking about taking group classes or yes. going through material at the same time yes, as others yes, um, yes. Um, as opposed to the self-paced 
courses that Coursera and, and these kind of books had started with, which allowed you to sort of do this as an individual, you know, you were like sitting in one room and, you know, yeah, uh, right. the um, oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, I think certain skills or, or you know, bodies of knowledge lend themselves better to that self-paced, self-regulated, uh, solitary school. Um, something like chess is certainly that. I mean, the, the, the histories of many of the top players involve you know, being by themselves, learning at their own pace, going through books. Um, that's, I mean, at some point you do have to play another person you, you, to sense of, you know, have a sense of who's out there. But in this day and age, you can do that without leaving your house. So it's still a very solitary thing. Um, whereas I think um, uh, in other cases, I did much better with, with group learning, cohort learning, uh, as I mentioned, drawing, for example, art, art class. I mean, number one, just going to an art school and being surrounded by the environment of, it just, it, it, lent, it lent the activity to my mind, a more kind of sense of, of seriousness. And, and then having other students in the class and having a time and place I needed to be every week just improved my, you know, kind of sense of accountability and my motivation. Whereas, you know, I often find that when I try to do something at home at my own pace, I find myself not doing it. It's always something I can put off till tomorrow because I'm busy with something else. So just, yeah, I, I find that other people are a great motivator. And um, as I sort of mentioned before, there's this idea that no, no matter what the thing was, I was actually learning not just from the, the teacher, but from these other people around me. Uh, and I was also teaching them in a way, which is part of the learning process. So, you know, it's kind of the, 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 the sum was, was greater than the, the parts. There was this kind of, you know, uh, magic almost that that took over so um and then yeah so i i think again it probably depends on on the on the thing i you know i am probably an inherently social person so i you know i sort of liked doing things with others although there is that added question though of things of notions like embarrassment where <laughs> this is a great stumbling block for many people they they would prefer to learn at home or in the privacy of their home with an instructor because they don't want to be seen looking foolish in front of others and but i found that you know in all of the experiences i had that that was never an issue that people were you know, these this is a self-selecting community of adult novice learners they're you know it's a very open-minded very accepting group that is mostly they're busy with their own issues of what they're trying to learn and they're they're probably also worried about looking foolish so in that you know I, we often have the sense that people are looking at us more than they really are. I think it's been called the spotlight effect in psychology, uh, whereas no one typically cares. They, yeah, sure, you fell, you fell at surfing, but so did ten other people, um, and that just makes it, you know, also more more fun as well to sort of go through a certain experience with a group. I did, for example, a five-day drawing seminar, intensive five-day drawing seminar, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five. You know, by the end of that week, I felt, you know, I felt much closer to this, this group of people I was with. And I felt like we had all gone through this process together and, and we had to do a before and after portrait drawing. And all of our portrait drawings at the beginning were sort of not that great. Some were better, but then at the end, everyone's was better than where they had been. So it just, you know, it was a sense of bonding and, and um, just, just made the achievement seem even that, that more memorable, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, pick the right kind of uh, skill and the right kind of person for these cohort based communities, uh, you know, courses. Think, think. Uh, about all those aspects, right? Yeah, and, and I guess in some cases there are, there are practical considerations. There may not be a cohort. That, right. You know, you have to go with what's available to you at, at the moment. Uh, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of these, uh, you know, CXOs and founders who are regular listeners and uh, viewers of, of this uh, Smartcast. So if you were to uh, give three pieces of advice to these leaders, about the kind of environment they should have uh, to encourage learning in their organization. You know, everyone, all leaders want their organizations to be this continuous learning machines. Uh, so if you were to give three pieces of advice to these people about, you know, 
how they should think about learning in their organization what would they be um great great question i you know i feel it's a bit it's a bit overwhelming for me you know I, after my book came out for example i had a call from thinking of, of india uh, ravi kumar of infosys who, who's a great you know proponent of and i quote him in the book about you know in this day and age we need to learn we need to relearn we need to unlearn and you know so he was he's very keen on the, on these topics and um i don't know you know I, as as a as a person who has a very solitary individual job i'm hesitant to give advice based you know on organizational uh behavior because i'm just not that familiar with what goes on in organizational behavior but some of the takeaways i think from just my own process you know i think may be applicable here which is that what you know what i mentioned before is that goal setting you know i, I think we need to give a certain amount of, of flexibility and, and space for people to operate as beginners. I mean, you know, this is, again, it's a very, it's a very difficult position for people to find themselves in, but it's also an increasingly common one. There's a computer science professor named Peter Denning who, who talks about, uh, he, he wrote something called the beginner's creed. And you find this in the software world quite a bit, which is that people that were experts on something last week suddenly the ground shifts, there's a new technology, there's a new system, and they are suddenly beginners. And, and you know, the, the, the change is quite momentous. And you know, they, I think you know, adaptability is, is the watchword uh, today, you know, rather than learning one very deep set of skills. There are certainly professions that that is required, but for the most of us, I think you know, this learning how to learn is going to be the more important thing that we have to deal with. Um, and that, you know, so you can't have this kind of rigidity of, of goals and expectations being too high that we need to give time and space for people to, to prosper. Uh, we often, I think we get hung up on the idea of, of innate talent a little too much and that we think that, I mean, there's been studies, for example, about um, child prodigies in music and when you look at sort of the successful concert pianists today, most of them were not clearly identifiable at a very young age as, you know, going to be great. They were pretty good, but they they really didn't mature till much later, and their talent really didn't bloom until much later. So, you know, if someone had if someone had sort of looked at them and thought, well, you're you're simply not good enough and, and sent them on their way and not let them into some class, you know, it might have short short circuited that that career. So I, I think, you know, this, yes, some people have, you know, a certain amount of inherent talent, but there's another part of talent that needs time to to grow and to be encouraged and may come through an unexpected uh, direction. So um, and, you know, some of the other themes from the book, just embracing embracing failure. I mean, there, there can really, I mean, Daniel Dennett, the philosopher says this, he, he's talking about evolution, but, you know, evolution, human, you know, natural selection is filled with mistakes. That's how things, you know, get better. That's how things evolve. You need to sort of work through the mistakes, but if you, it's been called sort of an error-free learning environment, which I think is a very counterproductive, you know, uh, way to learn. I just a quick story, you know, when my daughter was young, I, she was learning to ride a bicycle. And like many parents, I, I got a bicycle that had the, the training wheels, as we call them in the US. And I sent her on her way. And I was, I was very happy because she had this short term gain, which was she was riding, I put this in quote, she was riding her bike around the park. Um, but what she really wasn't learning exactly how to ride a bike the way a bike is actually ridden with the dynamics of, of balance and the body. So she was speeding along and then she took a turn and she fell over because, you know, she was sort of encouraged to have a false confidence by these training wheels. And so anyway, so I, I took the training wheels off, I took the pedals off and she just, you know, kind of did it like a balance bike, what, what we now call a balance bike. And so this, this was more struggle sort of in the short term, but the long term was that she actually learned how to ride a bike, you know, probably actually more quickly than with the training wheels. And she's actually a very good uh, bike rider, I'm proud to say, and she was doing it very young. So, you know, but that it required making some mistakes and making the right kind of mistakes. The training wheels crash was not really a correct mistake because it didn't, she didn't learn anything about 
a real mistake you make on a bike. She just, she learned this sort of artificial training mistake that wasn't applicable to a real bike. So I think just, you know, having people make sort of mistakes in the real world is often painful in the short term, but can allow this, this larger um, long-term growth. Right. So those, those would be some, you know, perhaps some of the some of the themes I would have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, nice, uh, Tom. So we come to the end of this uh, conversation, but we're not going to let you go without asking for your hot takes on certain things. So I'm going to ask you about the future relevance of certain things, and you know, okay, uh, you can you can give me your hot take on that. So what do you think is the future relevance of schools and colleges as seats of learning right now? Great question. I, I think you know, prob- perhaps like like companies, we're seeing that shift there as well to less entrenched, sort of dogmatic bodies of, of knowledge and, and more more siloed, you know, sort of narrow learning and and more you know, sort of cross disciplinary, flexible learning that can can function better in the real world, you know, sort of as it as it is. Um, and that, that, that's you know, sort of uh my sense but I, but, I, but i'm not sure it's been a while since i've been in college so uh. <laughs> all right what do you think is the future relevance of nonfiction books hopefully very relevant um from my point of view but um you know uh this is a, a thing that has you know the book business has done well during the pandemic. I, I would like to think that reading is one of these things that might have been uh, rediscovered a little bit with as people had, you know, sort of more time um, as to how, you know, the type of nonfiction might change. I'm, to, to be honest, I'm not sure. I would, I would love to see more, you know, wider, a wider uh, selection of voices that, that we're hearing from. And, you know, as, as a sort of white male, I'm perfectly conscious of how I'm overrepresented, especially in the type of book that I often uh, tend to write, which is sort of, you know, uh, science, sort of business, psychology, and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, <laughs> it's a great question. But uh, yeah, now you're, I'm going to have to think after this conversation about, you know, how this is going to be. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the, the world is, you know, increasingly complex to try to understand. So hopefully there will be the need for these sorts of, of guides. And, and if any, and, you know, one, one way it may change is that it may have to become a little bit more nimble as we've been discussing, things will have to be shorter books, faster books, uh, you know. I, of course I say that and then people love to read something like Sapiens, you know, which is a study of the history of humankind. So I think we still like that, we still appreciate the big picture as well. Right, all right. And, and the final one, what do you think about uh, the future relevance of games or rather the specific game of Fortnite? <laughs> um, funny story, I wrote a piece for Wired magazine about playing Fortnite with my daughter because like many children during the pandemic, she was doing a lot of it. And I found myself sort of doing it as, as, a, as, a, as a guardian to make sure it was sort of okay. Uh, I found myself because it's a very well-crafted game with a very sort of addictive dynamic. I found myself uh, a bit, um, you know, addicted to it. And as a long time, at least when I was younger, a video game player, this was not such a stretch, but I got, I didn't necessarily want to play with 10 or 12 year olds as most adults don't want to. So I quickly, I I actually heard, got an email from someone who said, I I read your article. I, I liked it. Do you know that we have a Fortnite over 40 group that that plays <laughs> so um so i've been dabbling in that a bit uh much uh, you know and I, i've it's one of those things that you know it would be easy to dismiss as you know sort of like childish uh youth culture you know mass culture you know kind of thing but i you know i found that it's you know it, it's a very interesting world uh, on, on many levels and increasingly one that is not just a game but it's it's sort of a space that people inhabit that there are there are events. I mean, artists are releasing their albums through through the Fortnite platform. So you know, I, I, yeah, I find it a very in, interesting place. I don't, I don't you know, I, I try to limit my playing to some extent, but um, 
Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think the, 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 they keep predicting the death of uh, Fortnite, but it keeps coming back with, so, you know, who knows? <laughs> on that note, I think, uh, you know, we have to keep that open mind about everything. That, that's one of the biggest takeaways for me uh, from this uh, conversation. I think we covered a whole range of uh, topics and, uh, you know, starting from your own, you know, learning journey to, you know, the, the idea of learning, how to learn and bring it in, bringing it back to, you know, corporate learning. So uh, thanks a lot for this uh, fascinating conversation, Tom. Thank you, Harish. Very, very great questions. Uh, thank you. If you like this, we know you care about your and your team's future relevance. You can find us and you know, click on the subscribe button on YouTube, Spotify, Google and Apple Podcasts. You can also find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. There are two ways to enter the insider group of friends of CTQ. A Telegram channel where you'll get daily tidbits that help you think about future relevance and our weekly email newsletter called The Up Leveler. We've got some fabulous testimonials from our subscribers. We share special discount codes for CTQ compounds and exclusive invitations to our events on both these channels. Just go to choose to think.com, that is think with a Q, and you'll find all the links to subscribe. You owe it to yourself.